Um, everything you heard this morning is a good run-up into what Doug's going to talk about. It's going to be the grand bargain. S certainly, we've had little bargains within the context of the Colorado River Compact up to this point, but this might be the granddaddy of them all if it were ever to happen. So, Doug. All right, there we go. Thank you, Jim. Let me start by thanking Jim and, and, and the rest of the gang at the River District for agreeing to uh, include me in the festivities today. And I, I told him, if you want me to talk about the Grand Bargain, I'll talk about the Grand Bargain. But people don't usually like it when I talk about the Grand Bargain. But he said, that's fine. He said, controversy sells, I think was what you said. Uh, I don't know what you're selling, but you do have a full house here. so. Uh, Good, good job. Um, if I am going to nitpick, one thing is that the, it's kind of tough to do these um, talks during a meal. Um, and I guess I'm, maybe I'm a little biased about this because the first time I did this, I gave a talk in a, in a dry riverbed in Kenya. I gave a talk to a bunch of Maasai tribesmen elders. Um, and, and it was a good crowd. But I didn't realize it was a good crowd because they were promised a meat feast, which is, a, as the name implies, a feast where you eat nothing but meat, and these go for anywhere from one day to two weeks long. Where, um, and there was a meat feast that was supposed to immediately follow my talk. Um, and so as I was talking, there was people setting up for the feast, which was not silverware putting out or anything like that. It was... The, the highlight of this was during my talk, a uh, cow was led into the, into the area. And then after a very, very, I'll, I'll leave, you, leave out some details for you. After a very sweet little ceremony, the, the cow, uh, proceed, they proceeded to slaughter the cow. And this was part of my uh, ambiance of my talk that day. And so, so let, I guess I just say that with the hope that there will, no one will be slaughtered during my talk tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, the grand bargain. Um, I'm going to focus more on why we might want to think about a grand bargain rather than what the grand bargain looks like because there's no accepted model yet of what a grand bargain might look like. And on that note, I'm, you know, I'm not the official spokesperson for the terminology of the grand bargain. There are different people that see it in different ways and have different flavors and variants of it. But I'm going to talk about um, a grand bargain that, as Jim said, is kind of the, the granddaddy of all grand bargains, I think. Um, and it starts with the why. Why would we need a grand bargain? And so let me do what I think hasn't been done before and put some of this language from the, from the compact up on the board here. Um, and we've talked around this quite a bit, but we haven't actually looked at the language. But this is this idea that there are certain sections in Article C of the compact that make allocations. Um, and if you start adding up all the numbers, it, it doesn't add up. Um, Article 3A is where it says the upper basin is going to get 7.5 million acre feet to develop. The lower basin is going to get 7.5 acre feet to develop. Uh, Article D says the upper basin is going to let that 7.5 million acre feet flow downstream uh, each year so the lower basin can use that water that they're apportioned in, in Article 3A. And then there's this Article C that talks about, yeah, at some point we're probably going to need to provide Mexico with some water. Um, ideally, we would provide it with surplus waters, but if there isn't surplus, then this becomes a burden that both basins will have to um, account for. Um, there are other articles, Brad mentioned Article 3E, that, you know, that another one that probably doesn't get enough attention. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus just on these three and their interplay. Um, some, some talk about grand bargains just focuses on, on the item C there, the, the Mexican delivery obligation. And I guess I kind of see that as a, as a, as a baby grand bargain t dealing with that. I'm going to talk about a bargain that deals with all these things. Because the reality is... When you add up this math, um, you need 16.5 million acre feet of flow each year to, to satisfy all these conditions. And that's, 
you know, as Eric just pointed out, you know, we don't have that. Um, so how do we deal with this inconsistency? And an inc inconsistency that Eric, again, acknowledged that people, by the 1930s, this was already pretty clear that, that, that and certainly by the 40s when the Mexican Treaty was signed, um, people understood that the, the numbers don't add up here. So how do you deal with that? Well, we have a workaround for dealing with that. We say, yeah, we know the lower basin is going to be using their seven and a half, and they've used more than that for quite a while now. Um, and we know that, you know, we have enough storage in, in Powell to release at least seven and a half downstream. And yeah, if, we, if the upper basin has to deliver half of the Mexican obligation, that 750,000 increment the upper basin's been delivering, yeah, there's water to do that. And so we can do all that. And with the leftovers, the leftovers won't be seven and a half, but it will be enough to satisfy the current needs of the, upper, of the upper basin and really the needs of the upper basin for quite a long time. So the upper basin kind of agreed de facto to this workaround where the upper basin lives off the leftovers. You know, the leftovers after Mexico gets their one and a half million, after the lower basin uses their seven million, the leftovers are enough for the upper basin to live on. And that's the way it's been and that's the way it is today. Um, but I want to walk you through a scenario where that, that, that workaround no longer works correctly. And so I'm going to, and before I get to the next, next slide, I'm going to preface it by saying um, you've seen a lot of numbers and a lot of complicated math so far today. This is the other end of the spectrum. I call this the, the cocktail napkin scenario. This is just very basic numbers. Um, I took all the nuances and all the, all the tricky bits out of it, uh, just trying to leave it very simple and conceptual so that I don't lose anybody with this. So this is, again, this is my cocktail napkin scenario. And I want to walk you through a thought exercise. And it's not a very pleasant thought exercise. So this, again, if anyone is thinking about slaughtering someone, let's show some restraint. OK, this is what I've termed various things. But it's this squeeze, this idea that if the upper basin lives and has to, in fact, live off the leftovers, then we're going to get squeezed at some point. So let's, you know, so let's look at these columns. So this is how much water is actually available. This has nothing to do with what the compact says your rights are. This is how much is actually available. If there's 16 and a half or more flow, 16 and a half million acre feet of annual flow or more, then yeah, then everyone gets what, everyone gets what is said in that Article 3. Article 3. The lower basin gets their seven and a half. The upper basin gets their seven and a half. Mexico gets their one and a half. Everyone's happy, no problems whatsoever. Um, but as we know, the, 20th, the average in the 20th century ended up being more like 15 million. Well, if you deliver one and a half million to Mexico, which is the legal scholars will tell you is the first priority on the river, it's an international treaty, and, the, and you know Me and lower basin's gonna keep using their seven and a half, what is the leftovers at that point? Well, the leftovers are about six. Well, six is not what we bargained for, you know. We, and Article 3A says the upper basin gets seven and a half, not six. But six m is more than we're using, so it doesn't cause a problem that the math doesn't, isn't working quite right here. Um, and, and folks in the upper basin long ago said, you know what? Well, let me back up. Folks, folks in the upper basin started saying, you know, what is the number for us? What is the practical number of what we're going to get? And throughout the 40s and 50s, 60s, and 70s even, there's a whole slew of studies done where people are trying to quantify what that number is. The one that gets a lot of attention is the one by Royce Tipton done in 1965, where he says, well, it depends on that, that if the upper basin has any part of that Mexican delivery obligation, but the upper basin will probably get somewhere between 5.6 and 6.3 million acre feet as a practical matter of what is available to actually use. No one disputes that we're allocated seven and a half, but how much is actually going to be, how much wet water is going to be there? We know what the paper right is, how much wet water? And so the number would come in at about six. Again, there's several hydrologic determinations that are done when projects are built, and those would often come in the six to 6.4 range or something like, kind of the low sixes. Um, and the thought was, Again, this isn't what we negotiated. This isn't what we were promised. Um, but six is pretty close. Six is pretty close to seven and a half. Um, 
you know. Well, hold that laughter. Six is p pretty close to seven and a half. Um, it's quite a bit more than we're using. Um, so it's not an, so the, this, this, the discrepancy here is not enough to rock the boat over. And what does rock the boat over? Rock the boat means go in the lower basin and say, you know, we demand some sort of remedy to this. It's not worth rocking the boat over. Well, let's talk about a river under climate change. And I've been very fascinated to see that every talk today has had climate change as a theme and to observe that 10 years ago you couldn't get away with that in a, in a meeting like this talking about that much climate change. But I'm going to talk about climate change because this squeeze I'm talking about is a squeeze that happens through, a, through climate change and through a, a process of, of annual average flows declining. Let's talk about, again, with this, this cocktail napkin quality math here, uh, a river that's 10% that's lower than the last century, the 13.5. Um, again, you do the math, one and a half goes to Mexico, lower basins using their seven and a half. What's left? Four and a half. Well, okay, already now the picture's starting to change because we use in the neighborhood of four and a half now. Um, that's a concern. Well, let's talk about dropping 20% to 12, a, m a flow of 12. Um, you might say, well, my God, you know, we're never going to get there. Well, we're down 16% already this century compared to last century. So we're most of the way there, um, you know, um, and that's and that's be, and that's with precipitation this century being about three or four percent less than last century. It's not this drought everyone likes to talk about. I don't. I refuse to call this a drought anymore. Yeah, we're down. The precipitation's down. It's down three or four percent. That to me is is I don't know. Is there a baby drought? I mean, I don't know what the term is. So that's that's just barely enough to talk about this being some drought. It's not this horrendous, severe drought people talk about. The precipitation's down just slightly, but stream, throw, stream flows are down much more dramatically, and it's this warming effect that Brad's talked about and written about. You know, I've lived in Colorado for 53 years. This Colorado's two degrees warmer than when I f first got here 53 years ago. I mean, that's not trivial. That affects everything about the hydrologic cycle and it's reducing flows. So that, so that number of, of, you know, an average of 12, that's not crazy. You keep going, you know, you can keep going forever on this road. By the time you get to a decline of about 25% or more and do this math, we're down to present perfected rights. In other words, the, the, the amount of water we would have been guaranteed had the compact never existed. Uh, now the question is, the question before you is, are we on this road or aren't we? Because if we are on this road, at some point, we cross this, this line between, you know, it's close enough, let's not rock the boat, to this isn't close enough, we better rock the boat. And, and what is that point? Uh, I, I suspect, and this is my speculation, I suspect that point is a compact call. Because a compact call would happen, when a compact call might happen, the lower basin would be using roughly twice what the upper basin is from the main stem. And if you add in lower basin tributary use, it's more like close to three times as much we're using in the upper basin. And so I just envision this day, whether it's five, 10, 20 years from now, you, you know, you guys are in your offices and your, in your homes and, and you get a call and you answer the phone and it's, oh, it's so-and-so from the lower basin. And they're like, yeah, we're gonna do that compact call thing. Uh, Sure, we're using two to three times as much water than you are, but we're going to do that compact call thing. So it'd be really helpful if you could just go and close your head gates. You know, I mean, and you guys got to give me the reality check here. I don't think that would work. I don't think that would go over very well. You know, I just don't think administering a compact call under those circumstances is, is feasible. Um, it, you know, and, and I think if you allow the process to play out to you get to that point, it's a really dangerous thing to do. And so this is something I think, I don't think you see, I don't think it's wise to, to, to sit back and just drift, continue to drift. You know, we've drifted halfway down this continuum already, continue to drift down there and see what happens. Because I think what happens is, is, is litigation. I think the compact essentially blows up, you know, this, this, this time ticking time bomb in Article 3C, you know, you can't ignore it anymore. 
and it blows up. And you end up in this interstate litigation, which nobody wants. At least that's what they say. So that's kind of the argument of why you should at least be thinking about a grand bargain. So what would a grand bargain do that, that's different from this really unpleasant scenario I laid out here? Um, and again, other people can interpret, other people can say what they want, but to me a grand bargain needs to do three things. One, it needs to rescue the compact. Um, it always kills me when I talk about this scenario that people think, oh, you're all against the compact, and when I do get away with the compact, it's the exact opposite. I want to rescue the compact. I think we put this time bomb in Article 3C in the, in the compact, and it's going to blow up what otherwise is a wonderful agreement. I mean, there's a lot of great things in the compact. Um, the compact speaks about equity. It speaks about resolving controversies between the basins, both at the current day and in the future. Um, it's a, it's, there's a lot of wonderful ideas, uh, mostly in Article 1. You want to talk about an article of the compact that people ignore. Article 1 is the best article of the compact. It sets out the, this, this philosophy of equity and sharing and equality and, and peace and harmony. And that's, you know, that's what we need to protect. So the first goal of a, of a grand bargain is you protect the compact from, from this, these forces that will, can destroy it. Two, you stay out of court. Um, you know, the litigation between Arizona and California went on for decades. Well, if, if we go down this road I'm talking about, we're going to have a lot more complex litigation than that. You know, does that mean it goes a, more than two or three decades? I don't know, but it would be, it would be, uh, it would be a problem. All right? And the third thing is, how do you manage water if you think you might be on that, that cocktail napkin scenario, if you think you're going down that, how do you measure, how do you manage, how do you make good water management decisions if you think you might be on that path, especially if you think at some point on the path, the whole system's going to blow up. You know, someone's going to sue somebody, someone's going to refuse an order to shut a head gate, or something, something's going to go haywire. If you had a stable, predictable set of rules, you know, then you can make smart management decisions. And ultimately, that's one of the goals of the compact was to provide a stable set of rules that you, then you could build upon. Um, and it, it works in that sense to you get to pretty severe um, impacts of climate change. But we're already on that road. We're already seeing pretty severe impacts. Okay, so I'm going to give you one example of a grand bargain. Again, it's one flavor, it's, and it's kind of one of the bigger, grander of the grand bargains. Um, it's, uh, and you don't have to agree with it, but all I'm asking is that you think about it. Because um, if you think about it, then you'll, maybe you've got a better idea. And maybe your better idea is to, to not think any more about it, but at least think about it once, okay? <laughs> That's my challenge here. Okay, the, the phrase in caps there is the name of a study I did with some colleagues in 2013. Um, so this isn't hot off the presses. Um, this is something we submitted to the Basin Study. Remember when the Basin Study was asking for ideas and options and so on? We submitted this and they didn't look at it because they said we're not going to look at any solution that's institutional in nature. You know, we'll talk about, you know, we'll do a study on your, your proposed pipeline to the Mississippi, but we're not going to look at anything. But I, you know, I understand why. Um, I know, I'm airing, airing, the airing of the grievances has begun, so okay. Uh, um, um, but this is, the, the heart of this is the bargain is as simple as can be. Brad was arguing we need some clear, simple rules that don't just set, it, aren't just set up for people to manipulate. This is the simplest bargain you'll ever see. The upper basin gives up something and the lower basin gives up something. What the upper basin gives up is it agrees to voluntarily cap consumptive use at a level that's below the seven and a half it's apportioned, but above the you know, three or four million acre feet it might get if we continue down that, that uh, cocktail napkin scenario. So somewhere in the middle, helps mitigate the, the you know, spread out, out the risk of climate change impacts. And so the, the upper basin picks a number, uh, well, they don't pick a number, it's, that's the key of the negotiation here, what that cap number is. Um, and the upper basin agrees not to go over it. If they do that, then the lower basin agrees there's just no such thing as a compact call. You know, if Lake Powell gets into real trouble and there's a year we can't send seven and a half downstream, 
you can't send seven and a half downstream. That's just the way it is. Um, but there's no compact call. There's no need then to devise rules for a compact call. You know, any folks from the state engineer's office, you know, hey, you don't have to come up with rules for a compact call because it doesn't exist. You don't have to try to administer a compact call should it happen. You know, you don't have to go around to a thousand different people with a thousand different head gates and see what's going on. Um, you don't have to precisely then measure who's complying with the compact call or enforcer or whatever. The compact call as a concept just goes away. So that's the bargain. And um, so what's the number? In our study, the number we ended up using was 5 million acre feet. More than the, more than the upper basin is using now, um, but less than 7.5 that it's legally obligated to. And so this would be a voluntary decision to cap use at a number below what your paper right is. And in that sense, it's a lot like, it's a lot like uh, what Arizona just agreed to in the DCP. You know, they said at certain reservoir levels, we will voluntarily agree to use less water than we're legally apportioned. You know, so you can do this sort of thing. This doesn't require a new compact. If the DCP and the interim guidelines didn't require a new compact, this doesn't require a new compact. Um, so that's the deal. Um, the, 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 the next question beyond what the cap number should be, and again, we used five, but that's, that's just because we had to use something for our modeling. Um, the, the next question is, so why would anyone agree to this? And I think it's, it's, and I'll do this from the upper basin standpoint and lower basin standpoint. Why would the upper basin agree to this? Taking the threat of a compact call away permanently is pretty appealing, especially when you go, you can go to every existing water user in the upper basin and say, your, your water use will never be subject to a compact call. Even if the climate goes haywire, like many people think it will. That's pretty appealing. Um, you don't, again, you don't have to devise the rules for, for administering a compact call. You don't have to have those negotiations. You don't have to, uh, you know, talk about East Slope versus West Slope and how that would, gone. Um, the second bullet, the threat of climate change, this squeeze. Yeah, climate change, if it goes the way many of us think it will, it will squeeze water availability in the basin. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, but all that squeeze now isn't confined just to the upper basin states. So that risk is spread across um, the entire basin. And that should be more appealing to the upper basin than the status quo. And if the deal is done soon, I mean, if that, fi if that five number was acceptable and the deal was done soon, um, you're talking about a deal that doesn't interfere with anyone's existing use of water because it's above the current level. Um, you know, it seems to me that's, that's something marketable, you know, if you try to sell this among water users in Colorado, say every existing water user just got full protection. That's pretty appealing. Um, what's in it for the lower basin is a trickier question. There was an article in the Denver Post a couple weeks ago about the, about the concept of a grand bargain and this general, print, this general type of grand bargain. And they asked John Ensfinger of the of the Southern Nevada Water Authority about this. And he says, I don't know why we would consider signing on to a bargain like that. We're guaranteed a delivery of seven and a half million acre feet a year. And so I think the answer to that and to why the, grand, the lower basin states would want to think about a grand bargain is, are you really guaranteed that delivery? Do you really want to risk your water supply on your ability to see through the successful implement, successful and, and, uh, and, and, and prompt enforcement and administration of a compact call? Um, really? That, that assumes there will be no litigation, I guess. That assumes there will be full cooperation among upper basin users. Again, when the lower basin is using two to three times what we're using, that, but we're going we're gonna to ignore that. We're going to cooperate, and there's going to be no litigation. I mean, if, you, if you're comfortable assuming those things are rock solid, then, then John Ensfinger has a point, and he's guaranteed $7.5 million. I don't think it's safe to assume that, especially because 
if we do go by past this tipping point of starting litigation, and I'm arguing against doing this, just to be clear, but if we go past that tipping point, there's a whole slew of issues, legal issues, um, that the, the lower basin has some vulnerability on. And I listed a bunch here. Um, there's this one item that's the Article 3D does not say the upper basin has a delivery obligation. That phrase is not in the compact, delivery obligation. It's in other compacts. It's not in this compact. It says the upper basin shall not allow the flow to be de depleted such that seven and a half doesn't flow downstream. Well, if, 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 if it's the change in hydrology, if it's change in climate that's causing that reduction, that's not the upper basin's fault. You know. I don't know if that's a good legal argument. I don't know if you could win that legal argument, but you could certainly, seems good enough to, to fight over it for many years. Um, you don't need to face any sort of legal challenges saying that the allocation scheme was based on a mutual error, an error of fact. Um, I'm not a, I'm based in a law school, but I'm not a lawyer, so you know, I'm gonna, I already warned Ann if there's tr tricky legal questions, I'm gonna punt them all to, to Ann, who's up next. Uh, um, but you know, the contract, the compacts are contracts, there are certain principles about, about you know, the, the information that's used and the assumptions that are used. And, and it seems to me there's a good argument to be made here that there was a mutual error of how much water was available. Um, there is no, you know, it seems to be a lower basin doesn't really want to answer to a judge when, if the upper basin says, this is, not, this is no longer an equitable apportionment. Well, again, Article 1 says equitable apportionment. This is a goal of the compact. And Article 3A allocates the same amount of water, seven and a half, to the upper and the lower. Clearly, this, this concept of equity, of equality, runs all the way throughout the compact. And so if you're a lower basin, do you really want to stand in front of a judge and say, well, well what we think is equitable is to enforce a compact call when you, we're using two or three times as much water as they are? Uh, maybe you do. I'd, I'd, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, there's the Mexican Treaty obligation. You know, the, the, this, it says that water should come from surplus. Well, if you start digging into what surplus means, then you start digging into how the, the accounting of the lower basin tributaries is done. Um, that's a little, that, there's an area where I think the lower basin has some vulnerability as well. Eric mentioned some others about Lower basin accounting doesn't account for evaporation. You had, a, you had a few others on your list that I don't have. The, the thing is, we can make a list of 10 of these things, 10 of these legal issues, and kind of the, 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 the default that we've all been kind of using is the lower basin's interpretation on all these things. So it's like if we don't fight this at some point, we've already conceded defeat on all these things. Um, so, so you know, what's the risk in, in fighting at that point? What's the risk in litigation at that point for the upper basin? If you know that the, the, the default action is just to concede defeat on every one of those. You know, so I've heard the argument again, again and again that the way you keep people out of litigation is that everyone has to have something to fear. Well, if the default is that you lose on every count anyway, do you have anything to fear at that point? So, I, you know, again, I don't, have any desire to see any of this litigated in court. Zero desire. I fear that if we just ignore what's going on, we're, that's where we're going to end up. But something like a grand bargain means all of this stuff goes away. Every one of these issues, and the ones on Eric's list, and any other ones you can think of, interpretation issues, it all goes away. It's irrelevant. The upper basin uses with their cap, whatever that number is, and that's it. I mean, there, it would, you'd have to, you know, measure, measure consumption, and that's not easy, but, but that's it. Uh, that's as stable a foundation as you're ever going to get if you, if you do it right. That's, a, that's part of the argument here. Well, that's not part of the argument. That's the core of the argument here. Let me get to a few final things here, and then, then the fun can begin. Uh, I, I really believe that this this do nothing alternative or this sit back and let's see, let's see what happens alternative just takes us further and further to the rights of that, of that cocktail napkin scenario. And I think that's a really dangerous thing to do. Um, and I know some people will say, well, we're not doing nothing. You know, we negotiated the interim guidelines. We negotiated the DCP. Um, you know, 
all those deals, by and large, are deals to try to get the lower basin down to s using seven and a half million. And that's a, certainly a worthwhile goal. Um, the, the, you know, the, the lower basin DCP, the interim guidelines, and before that, the quanti quantification settlement agreement in California. All those things are making big strides to squeeze, to getting the lower basin back down to seven and a half. So we're not doing nothing. But, but you know, my, my, my little scenario already assumed the lower basin was using no more than seven and a half. You know, I already assumed that fight was over. You know, I've, I've, I've drawn the ire of a lot of people over the years by saying there's two big problems in the basin. One is the overuse by the lower basin, and the two is this, this, this problem of the upper basin getting squeezed at some point. Well, the first of those two issues I always thought was the easier one, this lower basin overuse, and we're nibbling away at it, and we're most of the way there with, the, with now the lower basin DCP. Now, we've nibbled it away in agreements that all expire in seven years, so there's a, something to think about. Um, but, 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 you know, we're making progress on that. So, so but we're not, we're not doing anything to deal with this, this larger issue that I'm focused on. Um, and I think that's a very scary thing to do. The politics of talking about this are toxic. And I, you know, I, it's no, you know, it's, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense that the person up here talking about this is an academic who, you know, sits in an office and on a campus and, you know, I don't really have any legal responsibility. I don't answer to anyone necessarily. Um, if you're an elected official in Colorado and you said, yeah, I think I'm gonna go, go negotiate one of these grand bargains like you said, what you would hear, you would hear people say, wait, 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 we're allocated seven and a half million and you're gonna go voluntarily sit down at a table and say, you know what, we'll only take five. You know, you're giving away our, our, our birthright, you're giving away our future, you're giving away our heritage. How can you do that? The politics of saying that, of doing that would be really toxic. You know, and I, and I could counter, you know, if, you know the, well, there's certain nuances here and I'd go through my whole spiel again, but, but you know, in the, in the era of sound bites and, and symbolism, um, it would be toxic to do that. Likewise, it would be toxic for the lower basin to say, you know what? I think, I think we should sit down and talk about this. Because then, you know, if John Insfinger said he's gonna sit down and talk about this, then, then someone would say, hey, wait, 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 here in the lower basin, we are guaranteed a delivery of seven and a half million a year. It's right there in the compact. We're guaranteed that. You just wanna give that away? You just wanna give away our hammer, our ability to do a compact call if we're not getting seven and a half? What are you talking about? So the politics of this are toxic. Um, the way you'd have to counter that, if you've got a chance to, to, to counter it, is to say, you know, you're talk you guys are talking about, you guys are talking about numbers on paper. You're talking about paper rights. You know, and we're talking, and the grand bargain is talking about wet water. You know, and, 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 and that's a little different. And it's the same, politically, it's the same dilemma the tribes get in when they have these big, huge paper rights that they can't develop because they don't have the resources to develop. And someone says, how about a tribal settlement where you agree to take two thirds of that, that original number, but we'll provide you with money to actually turn that into wet water. You know? And the politics within tribes, when those, that, those options come up, is very similar to, I think, the politics that would come up here. Um, the timing is tricky. Um, when, do you, when would you negotiate this? Ideally, you do it now and not later, but a really tough negotiations only usually happen when you're right at the brink of doom. So um, that's one issue. The other issue about timing is would this be a permanent agreement? Would this be a 20-year agreement? Uh, you can argue that it doesn't make much sense unless it's a permanent agreement. But you can also argue, you know, we've, through the Colorado River Compact, we've seen the, the danger of doing permanent agreements when conditions change. Um, in our report, we said it'd be a 40-year agreement that could be renewed by the consent of five of seven states. We put some thought into that, but we mostly just said that just so people can have a jumping off point of, of coming up with better ideas. The administration would be challenging. Um, you know, you'd have to tell people to stop diverting water once we got to that cap number of five, you know, and even though our legal rights would be higher, um, you know, the, the, 
what's the phrase in the Colorado Constitution? The, the, the right to divert shall not be denied or something like that. You know, you'd have to deal with these things. Um, so I'm not at all convinced this is the right model. What I'm convinced is this is a discussion we should be having. And I'm going to leave it there. And so this is a list of things I've written. The one next to the bottom is the demand cap one. The other one's about the legal issues. Um, the link at the front, at the top, will take you to those. There's other things that are written. Eric and John Fleck have a very nice memo out these days about the grand bargain. Um, it's worth reading, and there are other things as well. But all right, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Well, nobody's thrown anything yet, but but if you do I'm make <laughs> make it a meatball, I haven't <laughs> eaten yet. So questions. Up oh, there, okay, in, in the back. Or, okay, Ken, yeah. Doug, you mentioned that there are other alternatives. Can you <clears throat> tell what those other alternatives that have been proposed are? Well, I, I mentioned that memo that, that, that Eric has written with John Fleck, and it talks about, it talks about a, a grand bargain on this scale, but it also talks about a grand bargain that just addresses that one issue about uh, the up, does the upper basin have an obligation to contribute some of the water to Mexico. And so there was, a, there was a bargain that he wrote about there, and I don't know off the top of my head, I can't tell you the details of it, but I, I consider that a, in the category of a baby grand bargain. Um, I've been approached by a lot of people that say, if you really want to talk about a grand bargain in this basin, the bargain needs to be not between states or an upper basin or a lower basin. The bargain needs to be between the urban sector and the ag agricultural sector. You know, some, some bargain about, about how the urban sector is going to, to contribute, you know, financially and otherwise to, to, to some gradual reallocation of water between the two sectors as we go forward. Maybe that's the, what a bargain should look like. So I say this is one flavor. This is the flavor that I've fo been focusing on for probably 15 or 20 years. And this idea, if I didn't say so, didn't originate in my head. This was, an, uh, this was a bargain that was discussed at a, at a Basin States meeting, was it, in, in Albuquerque in, 2000, in 2005. You know, the, and I don't think that conversation went very far. Um, again, the, it's, it's a tough conversation to have. Um, my, my group, you know, several la years later, tried to put some flesh, flesh on that skeleton. Um, but there are, you know, there's not a whole long list of proposals out there I can point you to. But, but I guess my point is, um, you know, there's enough creative people that we could make such a list. And there's some people like, I have a colleague, Jack Schmidt, at the Utah State University, and who's, who's trying to set up a program where they can look at some of these sort of things, some of these bargains. Next question. Uh, just quickly, there's another player in here that we've been led to uh, believe is the federal government and their contract calls for power, yeah. aka a power call. And how do you suggest that gets entered into the agreement? Yeah, there's all sorts of complications here, the feds being one of these complicating parties. Um, I don't have all the answers there, certainly, but I, I guess I'm operating on the general principle that if the seven states show up at the at the at Reclamation's door and our Interior's door and say, you know what, we've, we've come up with a, what we think is a better way to manage this river that reduces all sorts of controversies, then I think you'd have the cooperation of the federal government to try to figure out how to uh, adjust power contracts and other things in order to make this work. Um, I know that's kind of, that's not a totally satisfying answer, I'm sure, but, uh, um, you know, the old, it's the old adage on the, on the river, if, if seven states can agree, agree to it, anything is possible. You know? and, and I think that's what I'm falling back on here, is that I think the feds would fall in line. Because all this uncertainty, all this, the feds don't like this. You know, I've yelled at reclamation many times for their modeling runs, where you know, when you run a model of the system, especially of a system as under stress, in order to do the modeling, you know, to follow the modeling to its conclusion, you have to make it, you have to make a ruling on all these legal issues. You know, you have to make a ruling of, of, oh, how much, you know, does the upper basin actually have to deliver, you know, and, oh, if, is, is there actually a compact call? 
You know, in the modeling done for the basin study, what they decided, if there wasn't enough water in Powell to deliver seven and a half downstream, they added what they called miracle water into the program. You know, they added what, you know, you know so, so, the, so, so the lower basin actually got seven and a half, and they didn't curtail anyone upstream either, you know, so, so they let both the upper basin and the lower basin have their interpretation of all these legal issues. You know, reclamation doesn't need to be in the middle of this, you know. If we can go to them and say, we got a much simpler, much simpler way of doing things, you know, work with us to overcome the obstacles to get there. Next question. You mentioned briefly the uh, the issue between I'm over uh, oh. the issue between uh, urban and agricultural use. Yeah. Uh, your grand bargain would bargain away our ability to support a future large urgent urban population when climate change proceeds. All of the people in the lower basin continue to live there, but lots of people decide they want to live in the upper basin, and now we don't have the water for them. You know, there's a, there's a finite, finite amount of water, you know. I'm, I'm not bargaining away wet water. I'm bargaining away paper water for wet, for a more reliable wet water, I guess I would say. And I'd also say the big cities of the West, you know, they use the same amount of water now that they used 25 years ago. You can't have, you could continue to have population growth in the West without huge increases in water supply. Seth? Uh, thanks for the talk. Super interesting idea. Um, it seems like the, well, it seems like uh, it is the, the, the underlying premise of your idea that administration of water rights in the upper basin would have to transition from one based on delivery of water to a point to one based on approximation of consumptive use at the farm level, which seems exceedingly difficult and might just you might just trade one can of worms yep. at a compact call I think for it another. Would be, I think it would be really, really administratively difficult to monitor and to cap upper basin use at whatever level is decided. I think that would be a tremendous challenge. Um, I think, but I think we're, you're, we're giving up some tremendous challenges and getting some tremendous challenges. And you can, you can argue, you know, this is, trading one set of problems for another set of problems, or one can of worms for another can of worms. I guess I would, my counter would simply to be, I think we're, it'd be trading a big set of problems for a smaller set of problems, but that hurt, but there's still some really thorny problems in that smaller set. Last question, maybe? By uh, Eric Kuhn. Here, here comes the mic. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks, Doug. I just wanted to mention in, in the, the paper I put out with John, we have an offshoot of that. We basically go back to Delft Carpenter's preferred compact and suggest that there's, there should be only a cap of, tran of Trans Mountain diversions, which is you know, uh, exports out of the basin, because what's going on in basin is naturally capped, and it's, it, you know, urbanization is reducing uses on the, on the, on the, throughout the upper basin. So we suggest that the cap the negotiations, if they really want to get real, should really only come down to exports. And that mm -hmm. should conclude our lunchtime program, unless you had an answer. Oh, I just, the politics of that one are, are even thornier than the politics of the others, but yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> hey, I live on the East Slope, but get water from Clear Creek, so it's not my... Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's have a hand of applause for Doug. <laughs> Thank you very much.